Well, here we are in Blister headquarters with Corey Simpson, as he's known, and Glenn Morden. And this is really fun having you guys here in Crested Butte. Welcome. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, it's Uh, awesome to be here. Thank you so much. So we, here's the story. We all just wrapped up Outdoor Retailer. Um, I guess I wrapped up Outdoor Retailer later than the the U3, but uh, I think I got back at about 2 a.m. this morning. Um, But Corey and Glenn uh, came down after the show, and uh, Luke actually, I think, made it in after U2, and then I, I, you know... I came in last, but, uh, yeah, so we're coming fresh from outdoor retailer. And then we got up this morning. The intention was to go ski touring. It turned into more of an adventure ski tour. We took one of the easiest, like most mellow tours near Crested Butte and (laughs) made it way more complex and longer than it needed to be. But we eventually found some good snow. We did. Yeah. Yeah. Great turns were had. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, hey, Luke, let's go on one of the most mellow ski tours in the Gunnison Valley, but I want us to do a first descent. Yeah. And I think you delivered on that. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And we like tested the abrasion of a bunch of jackets by skiing into trees. That's and, true. Yeah. Yeah. So that was an interesting morning. Um, and actually, that was an interesting morning and afternoon. Mm-hmm. And then... Uh, yeah, we've been spending some time in Blister HQ. We just had a very lovely dinner at Secret Stash. And now it's time to talk a little shop and a little gear and philosophize a little bit about gear. Um, Glenn Morden is something like the lead of product innovation. He helps cultivate... <laughs> The words here that are important are something like product and innovation. There are reasons why this is a complicated thing to talk about. The reasons aren't that is interesting, but what you need to know is product innovation, Glenn Morton. How's that? That sounds pretty good. <laughs> pretty good? <laughs> yeah, thanks for leading that one in. Yeah. And thanks for the awesome ski tour. I think, you know, we go to a trade show all week mm-hmm. and we're super excited to be there. We have the ability to see awesome gear, every company. Every season brings like well, you know, evolution and things just get better and better. But at the end of the day, when you get out and actually use it, that's what it's the most fun. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you're bushwhacking, hitting trees, and like, trying to find your nav, that's that's good too. It's not all just like blowing pow turns. So, yeah, um, yeah we're psyched. Yeah. Um, and as far as product innovation goes, yeah, that's my title at Patagonia. Is I kind of am responsible for that. Um, and that's everything from the product that you guys see at the trade show to stuff that we're working on five years out, 10 years out, et cetera. Um, we've got our hands in a lot of great projects. So, This is per- a particularly good time to have you here. On Blister, we've been doing a whole lot of like gear trends and predictions about where things are going to be in 10 years. So who better, who better really to have come yeah. to town then Mr. My job is to think about where things will be in 10 years. Yeah. I mean, really, like, I feel like we kind of nailed this. Yeah. Um, now, Corey Simpson. Uh, Corey is at Patagonia, tends to work in the public relations side of things. Is that fair to say? Yes. I manage communications for product and sport community. So is communications is the word we would use more than public relations. I, I talk it's with my of, hands. I talk with my face. It's the same thing. <laughs> totally. I talk with my face too. Yeah. Now, one of the reasons we like Corey so much is because Corey really cares about gear. And so it's always been since we met you, I don't know, four or five years ago or something maybe, um, at Outdoor Retailer and have been in touch. It's like, we're always like, that guy, Corey, right? And it's like, yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah, we've always been a fan of yours and appreciate that you sweat the details. Maybe you could say in the way that we try to sweat the details. So it's really cool having you here too and and uh, getting a chance to do this. So, Thank you. I appreciate it. And honestly, as I told you earlier today, it's like this is a pilgrimage for me. Like, <laughs> I've been working with you guys for years, listening, watching, reading, like hearing from other people in the community, other people I work with. Like coming here is 
something really awesome because you get to put the visualization with everything you guys are going through and mm -hmm. it has a real impression like right now I don't know if the viewers at home can really get this feeling but we're <laughs> surrounded by just a wall full of incredible skis work innovation and it like all makes sense when you look at a blister gear guide or when you guys hear a podcast mm -hmm. or anything like that so I appreciate you guys having me and I appreciate you guys liking me because my job's easy. I just go and hang out with Glenn and his buddies. <laughs> I get to hear all the good stuff and they go to tell you. So <laughs> it's just a good middleman gig. Yeah. And that's the, the fun thing with the crew at Patagonia. Like at any point we can all go hang and have an epic day of skiing. And me and Corey have been on a bunch of great trips and the snow sports team, like the different teams that work on product, like it's a super fun place for us to, you know, work out of and at the same time we get to do these awesome visits and you know we're out in the market a ton and and i think that's probably some of the most fun we have mm -hmm. yeah well we're gonna i think bounce around quite a bit and sort of zoom way out and then maybe zoom way in at times um but since we have uh as i said been thinking a lot about 10 years out and that's your job, so you should be good at this. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, materials in particular, um, and specifically where you think we can see innovations in terms of performance, specifically performance. I realize that's a broad term, and I'm whether that's in hard goods or soft goods, uh, we actually kind of placed our bets about what what categories, what pro product categories do we suspect will see the biggest leaps, you know, when we look back in 10 years. But he's an actual qualified person to yeah. ask this. So, Yeah, and I guess I'm actually quite curious to hear what you guys think too. Um, we were talking about today just the, like the changes in clothing and clothing systems of dress, for example. And, you know, five, 10 years ago, I think we all thought that we had the perfect jacket system or we had the perfect layering system. And I think things are changing at a pretty rapid rate. Um, from like a true innovation standpoint, I think the things that are super important to us is obviously um, just the world around us and and the the energy and effort we can put towards making more sustainable product. Um, it's a real thing right now. So um, for us, for me and our team, that's something that like we want to see if it's, and it, it kind of sounds weird saying that's 10 years out. I want that to be, you know, 10 days out or yeah. tomorrow because it's, it's urgent. Right. And so we are looking at new chemistries, um, new ways to make products, new ways to make fabrics that all kind of have less impact. And I think, you know, off the top of my head, it, like impact is the one thing that, you know, I think everyone's looking at it, whether how you make the product, um, how you use it, how you consume, um, and then, you know, where you get it from. Like there's so many cool things right now that I think is very different way of thinking than it was even five years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, what about, like, I guess I'd ask you guys, like you guys said you play some bets. What's, what are you guys feeling right now as far as the things that are most exciting for you? Um, honestly, it's t tough to remember that conversation. It feels like forever ago. Um, I think, I mean, on the technical side of things, I think we'll continue to see this push towards stuff that works better at high outputs in terms of like on the skin track or trail running or mountain biking. That's also pretty protective. I think either, I think there will be more and more companies trying to hit that balance, the sweet spot. And then I think there will be more and more companies kind of diversifying and more targeting like these are the people that need something that breathes really well these are the people that need something that's super productive but then on that note like i feel like a few years ago a lot of brands would do like an organic cotton or recycled polyester in most of like their lifestyle stuff but i feel like over the past couple of years and hopefully over the next few years that's becoming almost like a mandatory thing for fully technical outerwear, like three layer hard shells and all stuff like that. And even just that outdoor retailer this week, I feel like almost every apparel meeting, at least like a piece or two in everyone's line, it's like at least the face fabrics, like partially recycled or something like that. And the effort seems to be there. So I feel like I totally agree. I think that's gonna be hopefully something we see over the next few years <clears throat> and sooner rather than later yeah absolutely i mean i can remember you know three five years ago where 
even opening up that conversation, you know, you kind of went to him and be like, oh, I hope that this goes well. Mm -hmm. And now it's not even like a, a, it's a non-starter, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think that we're all really well aware of what's around us and what's happening. And to be able to get content from recycled sources is much easier. And I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. And I think people are aware that there's plenty of of resources out there to use. Mm -hmm. So I think that though, the way that I was thinking of framing these questions is kind of first talk about predict where the biggest advances are going to be from a performance point of view. My kind of second question was, let's talk about materials and sustainability. And where, what do you think we could, we, where do you think we will be in 10 years? Where could we be in 10 years? And I am, I don't know if you think of this as a false dichotomy, sort of putting performance over here and sustainability over here. And you kind of just collapse that a little bit. Yeah, I think that's I think. a good place to start because I feel like we have to break down that. Um, I don't know if fear is the right term or just to understand that the performance is absolutely there right now as we speak. There is no difference between um, pulling you know, petroleum out of the earth and pulling trash off the top of the earth to make product. And I think it's up to us to start, to, like, especially Patagonia, we need to help get customers understand the quality of goods mm -hmm. that people can get now is as good as it gets. There should be no fear of like, oh, this is probably some someone's old garbage. It is not the case. So like the materials that go into the product that you guys are all using, it's all at the highest of level. So I think that's a great thing to really like set the stage is that we can match like, you know, and, and that was a trend like five years ago. I don't know what the opposite of like, in the future is it was a history but people were always like oh sustainability only applies to sportswear and lifestyle products mm -hmm. sustainability has as much of a place and present um in like our technical gear as anywhere so so you think just to kind of set a historical record straight five years ago if people were talking about sustainability that was almost exclusively in terms of casual lifestyle pieces you certainly can't be worried about that when we're talking about three letter three layer waterproof breathable stuff or whatever that's that's fantasy land yeah i think the problems were it, it, it maybe it was just easier to tackle it in a in a perceived simpler form and maybe it's like a t-shirt right it's very mm -hmm. simple and it, like the you know the end use is is you know i mean it's not as simple because it's so versatile but yeah. um I think people thought that the problem was so complex in a three layer shell, for example, that it just kind of followed. And, but I, you know, you see now the innovation that you, that's happening and we saw it all last week is that brands are really stepping up their, um, you know, seat at the table and, and everyone is doing a great job at it. And that's what gets me most excited. Um, you know, I get that question all the time, like what was the best thing you saw at the show? And it's the momentum around the outdoor industry now, which is taking action. And mm -hmm. I think it's amazing that we're seeing that. When we look at like the first part of the question or the, even maybe, I guess it was the second about like, what do we see in 10 years? I mean, that's a pretty like, you know, obviously I see us getting to a place and I want us to be in a place where um, product is more, you know, end of life is, is thought about the way we consume product, the way we dispose product. If we consume or if we dispose, like what that looks like, um, I think there's a huge runway for that. And I think we will see major change. You know, we're going to be sitting here today and we're all going to have garages full of old gear. I don't know if we're going to have that in 10 years. I hope not. I hope everyone's got great gear in 10 years and it might be today's my stuff that's in my garage is, is someone's great gear and, you know, tomorrow kind of thing. Um, I think too, like the end of life and where we get our materials from, that is the most exciting thing that's mm -hmm. happening right now. Like where people are coming up with new solutions for chemistries and the science that's going into materials is, it's mind blowing. And it you every day you read about something, some cool new way to like develop a fabric and um, or a technology in, in our kind of daily lives, whether, you know, be it like home goods or clothing, but it's very exciting. And then like, we haven't really handled and been responsible for everything we've made, you know? And so I think as we look at end of life solutions, like ideally let's close the loop. Mm -hmm. If stuff can't last, let's make sure it goes away in a meaningful way. And I don't really think trash piles piling up around the world is super meaningful. So I think getting to a point where we can reuse that. And I mean, personally, 
that's what I'm super excited about is that we can create solutions on our problems mm -hmm. and not just keep looking for more um, solutions, so to speak. I mean, I'm usually chained to the booth at the show and I'm happy because I get to tell so many amazing stories about Glenn's team's work, our product team's work, these random things we come upon that really have a big impact. But what I get fired up about is thinking about people have these aha moments and then they realize that you need to innovate through a challenge that's out there. So like Glenn's talking about taking the plastic, that's just the garbage that's off that top layer, making it into new things. It's incredible when people are almost handcuffed a little bit and challenged where that innovation comes from. And I mean, meeting with you guys, our first meeting that we must have had at SIA years ago must have sounded a lot different than what it is now. Because, mm -hmm. you know, then I was talking about percentages of recycled content. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now it's a given. Now yeah. the highest performing shell I'm going to give you that we ski toured in today, 100% recycled fa face fabric. Mm -hmm. And we have, oh wait, 60 other shells like that in the line. And it's, we're at such a cool time. Let me pause you on that. So say more about that in terms of the 2020, 2021 product line. You just said four or five years ago, set the record straight here. Four or five years ago, you were talking about a percentage of recycled content yeah. re recycled content yeah. and you just said we now have 60 we will have 60 pieces in line yeah so last year we committed it was it was a campaign we launched and it was something i'm sure glenn can speak about way deeper than i can but we committed to making every single waterproof piece we had in our line whether it's in kids sportswear men's women's technical or otherwise into being fair trade certified for sewing and made with recycled content and i mean that's whole hog that's everything we do and it ended up being around 60 shells and we cut some real killers out of the line that couldn't be transfer, transferred over mm -hmm. into recycled content. I mean, Yvonne's baby SST fly fishing jacket, Luke, you may know, it's, it's an icon in the piece. It's mm -hmm. literally been something that he's had his hand in designing every iteration since its beginning. That was gone mm -hmm. for two seasons because we couldn't get it into recycled content yet. That's the level of commitment that we took. But when I get to go to Outdoor Retailer now, I get to walk the booth I might have my head down with a half a cup of coffee left trying to make it to my next appointment, but you get to walk around and see what all these other brands are doing. It's like, it's amazing. Because we know that it's just not us, it's everybody else innovating and that's gonna push us all in, a, in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, and I think when, on one of our other podcasts, we talked about like where we think we're actually gonna see right. change and where we think there's a lot of potential. And I think your note about closing the loop, end of life, um, it, with regard to apparel is an area with a ton of potential. I think it's pretty challenging right now, especially if we're talking about like three layer, two layer laminates where there's oftentimes three different, not only types of fibers, but different weaves and plastics in that construction, um, which makes it obviously really challenging to kind of, you either have to separate it or come up with some sort of process where you can recycle all of that in one. And that's one area where I think there's a ton of potential, not only in like these technical waterproof breathable garments that kind of uh, get most of the attention, but also just in like, could we, like you guys started doing recycled cotton recently, is that correct? Or recycled wool? I, I mean, we've been using recycled content for years and years now. Um, mm. And it's just been- Content or cotton? Co cotton. Well, we've been using organic cotton exclusively yeah. since mid 90s. Yeah. Yeah. And that's always been a hundred. Mm -hmm. But now in the line we use organic cotton, recycled cotton, okay. recycled polys, recycled, I mean, yeah. it's like at, at every point we can get involved, we're doing that and making that transfer and that switch over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm interested to see where that goes. Um, especially like like a polyester or nylon, if you distill it down to it, like it's a very specific type of fiber. And I feel like that makes it a lot easier to recycle. But like we have all these complex garments with like, and then you consider like the thread and the trims and everything. And so I feel like that's where a lot of potential is. I don't think it's gonna be very easy at all. I'm sure, I'm sure it isn't, um, but I feel like that's but, an exciting area for sure. But how cool is this that we're at, that's what we're talking about right now. Yeah. yeah. And you know, even five years ago, we would have been like, is that shell five grams lighter? Yeah. Is mm -hmm. it that much faster? And Ray, whereas now the problems we're talking about are like, how do we, we we're talking about end of life. Mm -hmm. Like this conversation we're having right now in a gear conversation, mm -hmm. which is super cool. Mm -hmm. Because I think as we look around the room, there's a ton of different ways to have fun out mm -hmm. there, right? And so 
all the different products, all the different like energy that goes into those things. Um, at the end of the day, it's about like the output that you get. And that's what's motivating people, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're actually turning what our passion is, which is using great gear and having meaningful experiences in the outdoors to challenging like big problems. Mm -hmm. And like we're fighting climate change and, and, you know, trying to work on material science at a level that I don't think we would have even had this conversation five or 10 years ago. Yeah. And not to say that that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'm glad that it's happening now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's. So here's, you have not said this, and I was actually trying to push you. Why don't you uh, just I, ask me what you want? <laughs> well, no, no I, I, did, really I did. I did. I did ask you what I wanted to ask you, and you keep not answering the question. Which I actually think brings me to the point that I did this divide. I was talking about, let's talk about materials yep. and performance. So in 10 years, it's like the jackets we're wearing are going to be 50%, 90% more breathable in 10 years and be 100% waterproof, something like that. Yep. And then I was like, and then in a minute, we're going to talk about sustainability you have you won't you have not gone down that divide and i think maybe there's an interesting idea that maybe i'm the only one who hasn't thought about this before you're wanting to say sustainability is a performance characteristic absolutely and that's maybe that's not how i came in thinking about this right performance is how breathable is it you know how how waterproof is it um but if we, I think we should actually, so I'm catching up here. So, you know, sometimes I like to work out, you know, these things on air, but uh, if it's like sustainability is a performance element and characteristic, and we all need to be thinking that way, then that actually starts to break down this bifurcation of like, oh, so you only are doing the, this year's thing, there's more recycled content or there's we've moved inched closer to a better end of life kind of scenario and i'm sitting there like okay cool but like what about the weather protection and you've kind of rejected that bifurcation i think yeah and i think maybe it's because i don't know that they're separate and they should be inter like you got to take responsibility for that like five percent increase in performance like at what cost is it mm -hmm. and it used to be we just didn't look at the yeah. impact of our actions and so i can definitely go there what do i think is going to look like in the next you know two to three to five years i think we're getting you know much more scientific about the products we use and the function that we use them for we talked very early um in this conversation and it, it's actually great having a a podcast like this after you spent a day talking about things because there's great chats that you have and you mm -hmm. want to be able to like revisit them but the functionality of garments and use them for a specific use but then all the other uses that they're great at i think we're getting a lot more dialed on like whether it's waterproof breathable comfort um or if it's breathability in a mid layer or breathability in your base layer wicking or even anti-odor um that came up today on our skin <laughs> track yes, it did <laughs> um, <laughs> um but I think we're definitely got that under control. It, I'm not worried. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're will, not worried. I am about the not performance worried about the performance right, right. of product at all. We, and I'm not also worried at the cost of sustainability because a lot of people are always like, "Well, something's going to compromise." Then you're going to make things more sustainable, but they're not going to be as good. And I am absolutely not worried because we're every year, year after year, we're coming out with something that's like just makes that year experience that much better. And we take like you know, a three layer shell from five years ago to today, we've got incredible, like, you know, fabric qualities now mm -hmm. that give us a much better like experience. And when I say experience, it feels way more breathable than it's ever felt. Um, that being said, there is some science behind it that the membranes are improving. Um, the science that's going into them um, is yielding better output. But at the same time, we're learning a lot more about the constructions and the systems of dress that make us more comfortable. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I truly feel like on the innovation standpoint, it, you should brands these days, when the level is set so high, when we are so capable of the highest performing products in the best way, can you be you know, giving best of awards to something that doesn't have some sort of conscious, sustainable effort within mm -hmm. the product creation, whether it's end of life, material choice, all of those things. And at Patagonia, I mean, 
like we're constantly focused on building the most technical, innovative, highest performing products in the cleanest way possible. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's our line. That's mm -hmm. where we're going. That's what we're doing. And like Glenn says, it's like performance is only getting better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we absolutely come to every problem with a function. And we're not just going to build another fabric because it is slightly better if it doesn't actually is not meaningful. So if we're building a shell for you know, high output, it has to be better than the last one, or we just won't put it out. And so I think that still is the fundamentals of the way we create product, right? It's based on a core function, whether it's an end use or um, a specific sport that we're going after. And, you know, I think that's, it makes it easy to design into. I think we were talking about, you know, designing product and designing product for backcountry skiing. Yeah. It's really easy because there's a lot of different like operations that goes into a day of backcountry skiing. And, you know, I, in my lifetime have designed stuff for front country and backcountry, but you got a lot of thought that goes into the backcountry stuff. Like there's so many systems of the way people use product and how they move in the mountains. And there's a ton of problems to solve. So what I'm getting at it is it's easy to like really design into function. Given what we've been talking about here so far, and taking it to specific products, let's say in Patagonia snow category. Corey, pick one piece that you are particularly excited about that you think hits on some of this, what we're talking about this, um, you're excited about its performance innovation. You're you're excited about a step forward on the sustainability front. Like let's we've been doing the the thirty thousand uh, feet up view on some of this. So let's talk about a specific product. You pick the example. So for fall twenty, and we talked about this a little bit. Our current snow line doesn't change from last year. We came out the snow drifter kit last year. We all loved it. Comfortable, amazing. A step forward for us. Backcountry touring focused a lot of our customers were adopting it as potentially a 50-50 kit, right? Mm -hmm. This season for fall 20, we came up with two in, like unapologetically backcountry touring focused kits and built off of two different user interfaces, right? So we came with the Storm Stride kit, which is a hard shell, three layer stretch, waterproof breathable kit. We came up with our Upstride kit, which is a straight up soft shell killer. Now, the way that I move in the mountains, which is getting less and less, as my dad bod will tell, <laughs> is I really look to the upslope jacket, the upstride jacket as something that is really innovative that I'm really proud of, mainly because it shows the focus and commitment to that product performance without being distracted by anything else. When you look at the fit, the engineering, the silhouette that it provides, then you get a hand on that incredible soft shell material. You look at the, the pockets, the venting, just the intricacies of that piece. To me, I am so stoked and I'm like a proud parent looking at it because it shows that our design team, our materials team was laser focused in and they didn't get crowded by anything else. They didn't need to add anything. They don't need to do anything else. And I'm incredibly happy with that piece because it's for that person that's really fired up on the vert that may care more about that uphill experience than potentially that downhill joy. Um, that's going to be something that will really increase their experience. That's going to be something that they will appreciate love and will hopefully elevate their happiness outdoors and like for me to be able to talk about something that literally i may wear once or twice in a season compared to something i'm going to wear 10 or 20 times and still be that happy and proud of it that's that's kind of where i go with it hmm. and it's a lot of what glenn's you know that progression forward like don't make anything unless it's a better version of what need what what we've made in the past that jacket that whole kit is a phenomenal example of it yeah, Corey, I'll take that layup too. <laughs> so um, I think this is actually a good example of us being able to hone right in on performance and performance first. This is a, a collection that I'd say is probably 10 years in the making at Patagonia. And um, again, super proud of the team that worked on this, but we have the upstride and the storm stride, and we have a soft shell part of the collection, which Corey just talked to, and then the Storm Tribe, which is three layer stretch kit that we really wanted to create a classic ski touring piece that we could speak to a broad customer base. Um, definitely inspired by our partners in Europe. You know, the Alps is like the birthplace of ski touring as we know it. Um, we see it across the US and in Canada as well. Places like Rogers Pass and Jackson Hole, Utah, you guys name it. It's everywhere, right? And people are getting adventurous. And we really talked today a little bit about like 
the two different seasons for ski touring. Mm -hmm. And it's actually really challenging, right? Like if we think about midwinter ski touring when, you know, it's December, January and February where it's snowing a tremendous amount, like what is the ideal kit? For us, that's where we kind of anchored in with Stormstride. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make a very comfortable three-layer kit that you could move efficiently in the mountains and be adventurous with your ski touring. Um, it's modest fits. You know, we want to make it very performance um, built for like an athletic endeavor. Um, you know, so tons of movement. Uh, it was very much a handcrafted project. And I think, you know, one thing that we can touch upon is just some of the way we, the way we create product, but that was built by hand in our R and D center called the forge. And so we built the patterns in, in like actually in a high step position. So we started off that the pants are bent because you spend every other step in the backcountry walking. Um, from there, we, you know, handcrafted every feature that you see on there and we wanted to cater it to ski touring boots and split boarding boots, but you know, we wanted to make sure the fit was athletic and then all the features that you need. And we have all dreamed of all the products that we've always wanted. And I can name off all the, the classics in the last 10 years, whether it was the original Untracked that was a, a soft shell kit to the mix guide, to the um, recon, to the dissensionist, to the knife ridge, the knife blade. These products were like in all of their like different applications, amazing for ski touring. But now like the storm stride and the upstride was like, we, we nailed it. And it's kind of funny because those were all like kind of, one one bullet quivers or something i don't know what the term is but and now all of a sudden we have two but we really want to distinguish between like that midwinter you know three layer protection and then like as corey said being like super athletic and having a full soft shell kit mm -hmm. and i think we talked about it on the skin track loop there's a little bit of a happy accident because both of them also cross over so that if you wanted to use um you know, that soft shell kit, it's great for like spring projects and like big, big stuff as well. So mm -hmm. you can get into like some pretty like awesome ski mountaineering in that because of, you know, it's performance. And again, it's like, let's separate those end uses. When it's snowing and it's crazy weather, we've got great three layer protection. When it, the sun's out and you're going big, we've got awesome soft shell protection as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, like we had talked about how, like when we discussed just our ski quivers this year, like Sam Shaheen and I both tour in Colorado and we do it just about year round and our needs vary even just like in terms of skis first, which we were talking about then totally different between like a February power touring tip trip to a July, um, miserable masochistic trip. Um, and like my entire kit is obviously extremely different. So yeah, I mean, it's cool to see you guys focused on those, and I haven't used the upstride yet. Sam has that right now. I'm very excited about it because it looks like the kind of soft shell I would want to use, especially in the spring and the summer. And then was out in the storm stride today. Very positive initial um, impressions. We talked a lot about like, um, especially at the show, like perceived comfort and perceived breathability is a huge thing. Like a lot of people get hung up on numbers like the amount of times I heard 20K, 20K when I was at the show was baffling to me. But um, one of the things we've seen in the past few years, especially with hard shells, is just like all these new backers, all these new, new laminates that are just so much more comfortable. And funny enough, like the first time I really thought about like perceived breathability and comfort was when I wore one of the old trail running shells, um, three layer waterproof breathable had this very open knit backer. Storm and, racer maybe? Yes, yeah. yeah. And it wasn't like the most breathable laminate, but I could get so sweaty in that thing and it didn't feel like a trash bag that I just like jumped in a lake with. And that does make a huge difference, especially when you're out like, like today, when you're out a little longer than you expected to be <laughs> and you're maybe you sweat throughout the day and then you cool down and you sweat again. And yeah, having that, um, I mean, the level of comfort that we're getting, especially from hard sh hard shells that will be kind of an obsolete term, I think, in a few years, mm -hmm. um, is pretty cool. And having that, the two specialized options, I think, makes a ton of sense. And obviously, um, we've seen companies do that over the years, but especially in Patagonia's line now, you have such a wide range um, from people who are skiing inbounds every day to people who are logging a ton of vert um, seems like there are a lot of good options for next year. Yeah. And I think sometimes when you, 
when you speak to that, I think we can go back to that original question on performance. We are tightening that gap between perceived actual numbers and comfort. And mm -hmm. I think in the next five years, things are going to get more comfortable. Um, it's a huge initiative for us is learning systems of dress so that you're wearing the right thing at the right time. And I know it sounds pretty like antiquated, but that is a, a pretty big performance milestone that we will see is that we're going to design into those specific things. And this conversation around backers on laminates right now is a perfect example. You know, we were very happy with what we had five, 10 years ago because it was just like, hey, I'm waterproof. And I'm, the membrane's breathable. Mm -hmm. But now it's like, okay, well, it, we, we get that that's like kind of like the foundational like absolute, but now how much more comfortable can we get, you know? And so like, I think we're gonna see more science in, um, you know, like built-in layering technology, mm -hmm. I think, and just layering in general. I, I had a conversation the other day with somebody and it was crazy at the end of it. We were like joking, like layering, it works. <laughs> and it still is like something that I think we, you know, we think we're going to have the perfect shell, the perfect mid layer, the perfect base layer, but all of those things are super intertwined with each other. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think about your system of dress in that fashion, you could have the best shell in the world on, but if you're wearing the wrong t-shirt, you're going to blow it. So, mm -hmm. so um, you're, you're specifically talking about education in layering, getting more... uh, not education, but like, I mean, obviously we're going to try to do some of it for you. Right. So I think you're seeing like different types of base layers now that they might have more lofts so that there creates more dead airspace between like your skin and the bar the barrier that you're wearing, or it might be, you know, something that's uh, wicking, you know, to get you less sweat, or it might be something that holds more sweat because that's, what's keeping you warm. Um, so I think that's going to be innovation. You know, I was talking to someone the other day about like smart layering and smart base layer technology. So, you know, being able to mine that data too and saying, hey, I'm actually, I, I perspire a lot or like this is when I need to take my jacket off. And like, I'm not saying we're going to have computerized jackets or anything, but um, ways for us to know better how we're feeling and at what point we're using the right gear. And even it gets down to the point where like, whether you're a naturals or a synthetics people person, mm -hmm. you know, like I hear this all the time where like we have the biggest arguments with our peers is that someone's like, oh my God, that base layer is the worst. And then literally the next conversation, that is the best layer I've ever yeah. worn in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And so I think scientifically understanding those end needs for each consumer will get better. And I, I'm actually quite excited about like becoming smarter about the way we develop fabric. And like, again, I go back to the way how much more comfortable we've made three layers. And that's really just simply trying to make the backer more comfortable so the next to skin experience feels better. Mm -hmm. And so many times people come to us and be like, and this is in our like very like um, controlled field testing environment where they're like, we think this laminate is more breathable. And the numbers actually, it's the, the experience that makes you feel more breathable. Mm -hmm. And if we can control that and make that more, you know, a better experience, then that's a win for everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, the diversity and creativity in the layering is pretty amazing. Like, if you think about it today, I was a little self-conscious at the trailhead when we were getting into our boots because I was like, oh, man, Glenn and Jonathan, you guys both had a lot heavier base layers than I did, mm -hmm. but I had a mid-layer that I knew was going to keep in a little bit more precip. And, like, I sweat right now just talking about this conversation. <laughs> so I knew what I was getting into. Uh -huh. Corey, Bluebird I, like, day. in the morning when I'm waking up and, like, my little baby has got us up really early so the lights are still super dark and you're like thinking, I'm like, okay, what base layer system can I come up with? And that's fun. Cause, and yeah. I think everyone does this, right? Like we're not like like unique here. And I think that's like a, like especially what gets me out of bed in the morning is like different yeah. ways to do the same thing over and over. Also it keeps me up at night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's true. And like we're so lucky in the fact that like I was divvying up some layers for myself in my pack in the, in the trunk of the car. And I was pulling on a trail running jacket. I was taking out an alpine piece. I was moving in a trail mm -hmm. piece. And same thing with you, Jonathan. It's like you and I had two pieces that come in our trail run kit mm -hmm. where Glenn had some alpine and performance base layer. And it's just this crazy mixture of how it goes. And yet we all seem to be rather comfortable. I mean, notwithstanding some feet issues <laughs> uh, today, yeah. but it's that, that ability to be creative and pull across category and pull across things that like really make those systems so groovy and like as i said earlier i'm not getting out in the field as much as i'd like to so that mental like preoccupation of what am i wearing and how's it going to work and it goes like that we're just so lucky now because it's like everything performs it's just a matter of how you want it to perform and like what's that cocktail what are you going to make and you know this is the sweet spot mm -hmm. 
and it just changes so often. Like my resort kit, I feel like is dialed because it's so it's such a static environment apart from the temperature and whatever the weather's doing. But for touring, I've gone from like touring in just a base layer to touring in super light base layer and a mid layer to touring in a super light base layer and a shell and then throwing a puffy on later and like changes constantly. And like we we're today, I was like, what's your layering kit for like a storm day? What's your layering kit for like a spring day? And I'm, I'm always curious to get people's thoughts on that because people have totally different approaches. And but we still always see like every time I'm at a trailhead, like someone in like an insulated inbounds jacket skinning up and then you see them five minutes later. And I think it'll be curious to kind of inf- try and inform people more or just like let people know about the options they have. And I think Sam did a great job with this with a layering. Now that I think that we did a layering one one piece like a year or two ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but especially with the focus on breathability recently, the advances we've seen in active or breathable insulation has totally changed a lot of people's layering kits. Mm-hmm. Um, and then like pieces like the R1 Air this year, like getting these super lofted fleeces that are crazy breathable. Um, that's always just like a fascinating topic for me. And like, yeah, either whether it's the night before or the morning of, I'm like running through probably like 10 to 20 different pieces that could all work in conjunction with each other. Um, just to- So let me ask you guys a question because this is something that keeps me up at night, but definitely gets me out of the bed in the morning. I want a quest to simplify that because, mm-hmm. you know, and it's kind of a, uh, I should be wanting to create more product because, you know, in my role at, mm-hmm. you know, within the team is we're constantly looking for the next best thing, but the ability to simplify, I think is yeah. super pure too. And a lot of people always ask you that, like, you know, are you guys making things too complicated? And so, yeah, we definitely struggle with that. And that's something that's a tension that makes, we're constantly looking to simplify and refine the solutions that we have. And that's why we keep kicking around like, yeah, we could have like left the R1 20 years ago when we started the R1, mm-hmm. like, and it would have been great. But we keep finding these little, like looking at these little stones and we find some cool new technology. And more often than not, things like the R1 definitely stays in the line for a good reason. Cause it's like, you know, a workhorse and it's just so consistent, but it is really cool. And you know, that's what motivates me. So I guess I'd, ask you guys each the question of like what drives your layering desire is it to you know have a more modular system is it to be more active like i don't know honestly mine would be i mean it's complicated because we review stuff as part of our job but like simplifying it as much as possible like if i could have a base layer mid layer shell combo that worked from October through April, that would be sweet. Or in in temperatures from like zero degrees to like 30 degrees. Um, That's always my goal. But at the same time, I think in the same vein as you were talking about, like, I'm always like, this could be a little bit better. And then I want to try something new. And then that complicates things. But like, ideally simplification, but always aiming for like not having to change layers as often, not getting as sweaty, not getting as wet from the outside, stuff like that. Pretty straightforward, but ideally it'd be just a really simple kit. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we talk about the notion of the one ski quiver and if it was like this base layer, this mid layer, this shell, and you know, in the way that we do, there isn't such a thing as the one ski quiver for every place on earth. And we pay attention to geographic areas and, you know, that kind of thing. I think having that, so if I'm a, if I am only an inbound skier in the Rocky mountains, or I only ski backcountry on the East coast, or I do one trip a year to Japan, right. And like, Ding, ding, ding. This would be your kind of money kit. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of simplification and that extending of the performance envelope, and I guess that means in terms of back to... I For me, I would think it first and foremost, breathability and weather protection, though packability for some people is going to be 
I think an important third. Um, yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> I want to say Luke kind of real sneaky, snuck in, sneakily snuck in a comment about 10 minutes ago about, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, of course, Obviously, there's going to be a breakdown uh, between or a um, conflation of soft shells and hard shells. And he kind of just said that as if that was a matter of fact. And I'm curious to ask, like, are we going to see the death of those two categories that we don't talk about soft shells versus hard shells? I mean, it's. The term hard shell, I think, used to be more applicable than it is now because waterproof shells used to be really stiff and crinkly. Yeah. Now, now when I think about hard shell versus soft shell, it's more like, does it have a waterproof laminate? And then there's also like the minutia of like, how waterproof is it? How right. breathable is it? Like certain hard shells you could classify as soft shells. Certain soft soft shells are basically hard shells if depending on how you think about it so the question is to you do you think that term will collapse in that say in five or ten years we won't talk about like oh you going with the soft shell or hard shell it's just a shell or jacket but we don't you know what i mean is that yeah, category absolutely. going away or that distinction going away i don't know if i could say yes or no fully on that one but i think what we're getting at is really functionalizing the need for the shell that you're wearing and even using the term shell, um, the outer layer, mm -hmm. I think we can match the needs of the consumer or the end user for what they need it for. And, you know, I think sometimes we are using way more product than we need. Um, and more often than not, you, you know, and I think we're kind of guilty of that because we all want to either aspire to be in an emergency and or know that if we are in that emergency that we're covered yet at the end of the day you don't actually ever really want to be in that situation so um i think developing fabric that will meet the needs of that end use is going to be paramount and that's what's where we're going to get to so you're going to be able to be like i am in this type of condition this is the appropriate jacket for those conditions and it might be that I can stay wet or sorry, stay dry for, you know, two hours or three hours or four hours. We can, you know, measure that. I think we'll have that technology to get us there. And so, yeah, it might not be soft shell or hard shell. It might be how wet do I want to, you mm -hmm. know, what kind of climate am I in? What kind of garment do I want to wear for that climate? Will you say more about that backing you up for a second? You say we, <laughs> we tend to dress for what we perceive to be the emergency, the kind of worst case scenario. Yes. And yeah, say more. I have a lot of like funny, like, what do you call those? Like ways of train of thoughts. But like one of them is, for example, most of us, if we live in the mountains, have a four wheel drive car, or even then maybe most of us who live in the foothills of mountains have a four wheel drive car for the rare time that we ever like put it into four wheel drive. And so we're literally towing something around that we don't need. So I think that we're going to kind of get to a point where we don't need to carry as much gear. And, you know, there's plenty of like layers that will protect you from what you're actually experiencing. And I have this other like stupid saying that I say a million times. And actually I use the iron skillet in a lot of different metaphors. But in this one is <laughs> that if you put it on the stove, you put on height, and you put a couple drops of water in it, they disintegrate instantly. And for me, that's what soft shells were 10 years ago. You could literally get enough like BTUs going where you're moving fast. And if there's precip, light snow, you actually stay dry. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was a combination of like um, chemistry on the exterior of the soft shell. But the fact is you're moving so much like heat that it's actually drying. Um, so I think that you know, for that end use, a soft shell is fine. You know, and but then at the same time, if you're literally finding yourself in extreme extended conditions where you are in pouring rain or wet snow for a, a long period of time, you need to stay dry. You know, like you should be wearing that type of product. Mm -hmm. And and it, I mean, it's hard because not everyone can have multi like closet full of massive mm -hmm. jackets. Right. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that we tighten mm -hmm. like the end use need. And like, make sure the like the data that we're developing fabric supports the realistic end use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. Two things. First, the note about 
wearing a soft shell and it just evaporating precip. The first time I noticed that, it was kind of mind blowing. One, because I was like, wow, I'm still dry. And then two, I was like, if I'm producing enough heat to evaporate the snow that's dropping on my jacket, think of how much of that would have been trapped inside a waterproof shell. And then I'm like, wow, like soft shells are pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like I totally understand people who just want like one jacket, like they're gonna use it and everything from like spring rainstorms to dry winter pow days or bluebird um, skiing days. But yeah, it's kind of the knowing yourself thing. Where am I actually gonna be using this? When I go ski touring, am I actually gonna be going out when it's snowing all day or am I usually going out when it's bluebird? And thinking about how much you could benefit from, like you said, something that's specifically designed for what you're using it for and actually getting the product rather than getting the product that's specifically designed for what someone else is doing. Yeah, and so if, again, if we look at what that looks like in 10 years and what an innovation is, if we could have weather appropriate outerwear that keeps you comfortable, mm -hmm. then that, then we've kind of solved it, right? And so that's hopefully like a holy grail project is that we have, and let me rephrase that again, it's weather appropriate outerwear. So if it's sun protection, mm -hmm. if it's wind protection, if it's rain protection, but it's appropriate to the environment that you're in and you're comfortable, then I think that we really like kind of move the meter on like great performing gear. Mm -hmm. hmm. And if it's sunny and then I get caught in the flash storm, then that's we've really done an then awesome you, job. Yeah. Then, right? <laughs> then you didn't check the weather. Yeah. Um, I don't. It's your fault. Yeah. Um, there's a lot, of course, we could talk about. I want to talk a little bit, and I'm kind of stealing Luke's topic here, prototyping, right? Yep. Um, let's talk about that. One of my absolute favorite topics. Oh. I'm glad we're like kind of I'm taking a U-turn. Yeah. We're, we're coming down from philosophy and we're getting into like real hard facts. Prototyping, yes. What can you tell us about the process? How do you guys think of and practice prototyping at Patagonia? I think that we're really fortunate because our company was founding, founded on making really badass gear, going out and using it and coming back and refining it. And it was incremental refinement that made Patagonia's gear what it is today. So, you know, it's not a, it's by no means a new philosophy, like make really good stuff, try it out and make mm -hmm. it better. And I just think that we've kind of moved pretty quickly in society and we've we consume things at such a rapid rate. We might have lost some like really great processes and I'm glad that we're bringing them back. And so for us, prototyping looks like, you know, it's a concept, it's a philosophy, it's a conversation, whether it's with our athletes, our ambassadors, our field testers, our customers, um, and we, you know, have an ideation and we have a facility in Ventura at our head office. It's our R and D center. We call it the forge where we can build any type of piece of gear that we make. Mm -hmm. And so if a designer, if anyone has an idea, they can go into that center and we can hash that idea. out. So for every product that you guys get as a consumer, we've put a lot of miles on, you know, what our best foot forward is. So, you know, if it's like tinkering on a pocket detail for Tyler's hours, if it's literally a silhouette, a color, um, we can do all that in-house. And I think it just gives you control of like your intention and it allows you to bake something and go and fail. Or you can, and sometimes they say fail fast, but you know, we say is to succeed fast because you move through an idea, you get it out there and you get like immediate feedback. I mean, one of my favorite things about getting out with Glenn and doing random things and like whether it's surfing or skiing, I always like being out in the field with him because he's always wearing, trying, testing, thinking, improving. And like Glenn's timeline, his scope of work is so far out that like those products may never see the light of day, but an incremental improvement within that product, within that proto may get us to another step that mm -hmm. maybe not even isn't intended. Maybe it's a happy accident, maybe whatever it is, but it's that use, it's that creativity, it's that, that constant refinement mentality that like really makes magic happen and yeah, our field think... testing like happens i mean you, i was when i was working at the front desk before i was in the pr team it's just like you'd have a guy from our field testing team 
oh, you're a medium? Sweet, man. Want to wear this shirt? Tell me. And you're like, this is an Aloha shirt. What am I going to do with this? He's like, wear me and tell me how you feel. Like, let me know what's going on. First impressions. <laughs> and when you think about that level, like Glenn said, if somebody's got an idea, they're able to go in there and participate in that process. And that's really key. It, it's, it really is. From whatever scale, weekend warrior to full-blown professional to an actual professional who can make these products by hand, like it it all adds up and you can really see it in the refinement. And Corey, I'm quite flattered to, to that you enjoy being out with someone wearing a bunch of like weird <laughs> prototypes that might or not, might not work. But the one thing is it's cultural and that yeah. our whole design philosophy and design team is the exact same way. Like everyone is so passionate about the product that they work on. And you see a lot of crazy ideas come and go, and that's what's awesome about it. And you know, like I'm most proud when I go to work and I see wetsuits on the railings because I know people are out there surfing, mm -hmm. and you know, working on what they're working on. If you see the vans and the cars coming in like early on a Monday morning because people have been away for a long weekend and they've went out and like, that is for me the most important thing about my job is in making sure that we keep that culture of people getting out and getting after it and using great gear. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, like it, it happens, it's it's across our design team, which is, that's sweet, right? And that's what the R&D center was meant to be, was to get people to build product that they want. Because more often than not, you build the stuff that you want. If you do the thing, like the sport, you're probably building pretty cool stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And like how many, there's what, like a hundred pairs of skis in this room. But if each one of us sat down and had like a dream, we could like, uh, like the day on the on the computer machine to make a new pair of skis, we do something else too, because we love skiing and we love using skis. And so, I think getting people that love doing what they do, and you know, even like when we look across the scope of our designers, whether it's a you know an end use sport designer to one of our sportswear and lifestyle designers, everyone brings that same passion, and it might not just be going climbing or skiing. It could be like, you know, within like our art community or architecture, etc. So. Like it's a culture of people that really love building stuff. And I think that's that's a heritage of Patagonia. Mm -hmm. you know? I kind of want to circle back a little bit where we started this conversation, which was, again, this is an exercise that we went through on some earlier Gear 30 podcasts. But if we throw this door wide open, because I know both of you, you don't just think about apparel that Patagonia is making. You care about... I mean, I know for a fact, because Corey, you were grilling me about different ski design questions earlier. And Glenn, I know you think about <laughs> that stuff. So we were doing this thing like, all right, you got to wager a thousand, you got to put down a thousand dollars on where we will see the biggest improvements in which product categories when we look back in whatever, 2029. Um whether that's helmet goggles, whether that's in avi packs, whether that's ski design, apparel, where would you put your money down? Like this is this is where we will look back and see we really moved things forward. Um, and again, I guess I am back to focusing on the performance point of view, but curious. I don't want to take any Glenn's thunder, but earlier <laughs> we were talking about, you know, he was just at ISPO. It's a really wild world over there in Europe. There's a lot of incredibly forward-thinking brands, companies, and a, a real high-performing user base over there. And Glenn had mentioned that he wants to see you know, more sustainable thought process into the materials that are going into the hard goods. And we talked a lot about end of life, and it's something that's really tough. Like, I have two small kids, and you see what they go through, what they grow through, and it's a passed-down culture. So within Patagonia, you've got so many parents, you've got so many active parents, that it's literally just like, a, it's just, oh, your kid's this old, here you go, I've got X, mm -hmm. Y, and Z. And it keeps in use in generation, and it's this beautiful thing. But that's not always the truth with some of these hard goods and some of these investment pieces that we use, and sometimes that we use to protect our own lives. And so instead of maybe the 100 skis in these room, in 10 years they're ended up in the gold mine in Ketchum for 20 bucks that are gonna be used at an 80s party theme. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's some end of life really brought into that conceptualization of that design from start to finish and thinking about that cradle to cradle process of design and and where's my mountain bike frame go and mm -hmm. where does my old beacon go and, and we're not just talking about the lithium batteries we're talking about everything and, and really creating that idea and 
when climate becomes so much more important to everybody, and I don't care if you're backcountry hunting in Alaska or if you're just going out for your day tour in Crested Butte, um, it's one of those things where it, it really does matter. And if, if you don't feel like it matters every day, you just wait 10 years. And like my two kids remind me of how important that future is mm -hmm. every morning. And so that's what I wanna see is that, is that bigger aha moment. We're so lucky in apparel, right? We've talked about it so much. You're able to say we're all of your brand meetings. You're hearing something about it. Well, it'd be really bitching to hear some of that in the hard goods space too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cody, I think you kind of nailed that one, but I still got a thousand dollars. So yeah. <laughs> I'm putting it down on sustainability too. I, I gotta be honest, we have no choice and we have no time to wait. We can't wait. Like for the, we every second we wait on investing in our like planet's future, I think we're we're falling off the back. And it just doesn't matter like if the beacons get smaller and the skis get lighter, if we've got no snow to ski on, then what's the point, right? So, you know, I want to see sustainability be the first question of every customer. How is this jacket made? Where are these skis made? What are the materials going into them? And what's happening after them? Are these mm -hmm. things, do these things end up in a dumpster? And I want people to stop buying that stuff because it's, a, it turns into a big garbage pile. So um, I think we thought this conversation would turn into like a super techie, like what we hope to see, but I want everyone who's got a thousand dollars to go out and start to vote with your dollars. And mm -hmm. because we have we have families, we have kids, and I want my kid to ski in 50 years. And I want him to ski on snow. Yeah. Like, and I don't want him skiing inside mm -hmm. because we made like a wave pool or a like indoor ski hall in artificial snow. And so, you know, it's true. The hard goods industry, I think it's time for us all to call to action and say, what are the materials going into these products? And I think we know now that we have the ability to get better raw materials that have come from a better place. And I think we should pay for it. Hmm. And if we all have a thousand extra dollars lying around, we can surely put that towards better materials. Hmm. So sorry guys, I know you wanted <laughs> us to talk about binding tech and yes, we probably won't have to have bindings to attach to skis. And I think that they'll become more versatile and self dampening, um, yeah, weight uh... sensitive. So if you're feeling like you want to go out and arc hard turns on hard snow or like hmm. go blow big pow turns. But I do think we have to like, all turn around and look at our own impact and what we're doing. Um, it's just, we don't have time. Yeah. It's just too urgent. Well, gentlemen, um, another good conversation. Uh, yeah. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Again, it's great having you here and, uh, um, we should do this again sometime. Yeah. Isn't we're it? definitely down to walk out of a trade show and go for a walk in the woods with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's nice. Thanks again, guys, for hosting us yeah, and for you everything so you do. Like, genuine appreciation for mm. the thought, the detail, the consideration, and the bigger picture you guys see here. I can't tell you enough, like in my line of work, it's real refreshing. Mm. Appreciate well, it. Appreciate that. And uh, yeah, till the next time. And uh, let's go do something else. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys.